Excellent. And I think this was a very short pause and I welcome back everyone to the virtual jug 24, uh, which is the 24 hour Java conference. Virtual jug is the online Java user group and we are reaching to the middle of the conference of those 24 hours. So that means that almost 12 sessions are behind us and uh, a little bit more than 12 are uh, in the future. So the next one will be the session. Let me just find my screen and find my slides about the next session uh, since everyone has joined. So the coming up is the G1GC by Kirk Pepperdine. The sponsor of this, uh, the sponsor of this time slot of this session is the Google Cloud. And uh, we have a couple of jocks participating live on this Google Hangout. So we're gonna go in talk about with the, welcome them in a second but first let's let's uh, just have a couple of words about the sponsor so Google Cloud platform has a variety of cloud services so it ranges from infrastructure as a service to big data to machine learning they have a kubernetes environment to run the containers at scale or you can just deploy applications to the app engine uh, Currently, it supports even Java 8, so you can bring your own frameworks and run your web or mobile applications on the open cloud platform. So, for example, Spring Boot works nicely. And on top of that, they're actively working with the Spring ecosystem to produce a Spring Cloud, Google Cloud platform. Uh, so you would be easily able to run Spring Boot starters and just consume Google Cloud, cloud platform services like Cloud SQL and so on. So take a uh, sneak peek, uh, click on the links, uh, go and check out the links, learn more about Google Cloud Platform and massive thanks to Google Cloud Platform for supporting the VJOC24 and supporting this session. Next, uh, since we have everyone here, uh, we have a Platinum sponsor Zero Turnaround, which is a main sponsor of Virtual Jack itself, uh, producer of productivity and uh, other tools for Java developers. So check them out. We are very grateful for the support and making the VJOC and the VJOC24 happen. A couple of organizational questions. If you are watching this live session on YouTube, you can join the Slack channel. Uh, and for that, you can go on vjoc24.com and there will be a button to join the Slack. And if you go on the channel live session, you can participate in the discussion about the session and you can ask questions directly to the speakers and we'll try to convey them and forward them to the speaker at the opportune moment. If you're using social media, the official hashtag for this conference is hashtag VJOC24. So all shares and all the comments there are appreciated. And the, the last moment, the last point is we were watching this on YouTube. So if you are just joining the video, then please make sure that you're using the cog icon icon on the YouTube video widget to increase the quality to the best available uh, best available quality for you. That will make the session much more enjoyable and the code snippets much more readable. So without further ado, uh, let's meet the participants of of this session. So let's meet the jugs first uh, because after that Kirk will take the stage. I think we have uh, Ivor and uh, Java Forum. Is that correct? Java yes. Forum, can you hear us? Yes. Hi. Hi. You look like a, such a team of uh, VJOC24 supporters yeah, wearing the same T-shirts. That's Yeah, we, we got a box of nice T-shirts delivered, so we made sure everybody is wearing them. And we have pizza and beer, and uh, we're happy here, and uh, we're looking forward to the sort of session. That's an amazing feat, and it's a Google Cloud as a sponsor is to thank for that. Among other sponsors, I'm sure they're sharing their responsibility for, for this. So thank you guys. I hope you will have a great session. We have another jug, uh, which is the uh, you reach jug. I'm sure I'm bastardizing the name of that. You reach you reach. I don't know how to pronounce that. Somebody help me. Eurig, Eurig. Uh, Jack. Hi. Excellent, Mike. Uh, Michael, hi. Yes. Uh, it's great to see you. Um, we so, are from Aachen, Germany. And as I understand, this is the umbrella jock for all English-speaking developers. So whoever wants to join 
Yeah. Yes, we, we're trying to reach uh, the Netherlands, uh, Belgium and Germany in our three borders area. And yeah. So excellent. If you're living in those countries, uh, check it out. I, I'm sure they're uh, great people and you will be welcome. So uh, both jobs are here and now we can go to, uh, to and present our speaker. So the hero of the session uh, will be Kurt Perperdine, the world renowned performance expert and the expert on all things JVM, garbage collection and everything. Kirk, can you hear me? If you can. Yes, I you're can. Sh you're sharing the slides. If you could just stop sharing that and show yourself to us for a second, if you don't mind. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, hold on. I have to stop sharing the screen then, right? Yep. If you can just. You're sharing the screen and it says stop sharing the screen. Okay, I'm stop sharing the screen. Sorry, the track lighting in my ceiling, just half of it or three quarters of it just went out. So the lighting down here is not so great. So this is what I look like. Uh, yeah, it's, but, it's great to see you. I'm sure this would be a, an amazing session. And uh, well, I'm sure you, you have a slide introducing yourself uh, as well. So I won't spend any more time on uh, doing this. Uh, Kirk, the stage is yours. Uh, tell us about G1GC, please. OK, I will start. Um, normally, at this point in the um, presentation, I would ask people, uh, yeah, um, you know, what are, is anyone actually using G1 yet? Or is anyone actually using uh, um, Java 9 yet uh, for, for anything other than just experimental purposes? But uh, uh, but uh, I guess in this format, I would have had to put a put a survey or something out. Uh, well, we can prior, try at least prior to doing that. Sorry, uh, we can try to do that with Jack's present, if you don't mind. If you can, yeah, it's yeah. I guess it requires a little bit of setup in this environment. So, so yeah. So excuse me, because I'm um, yeah, I don't do a lot of these, so I'm I'm probably um, not as adept at this as I am on on stage. But we can start anyway. So. I guess, uh, Olegi, as you know, um, with Java 9, uh, G1 GC was determined to be good enough uh, or complete enough to actually replace uh, the mostly concurrent mark sweep collector um, as uh, the um, well as the low pause collector, uh, AKA, you know, AKA low pause collector, and. They went one step further and they said, okay, well, you know, given today's machines and how ergonomics were defined, when ergonomics were defined, you typically got the parallel collector as being your default collector. So if you didn't set anything on, on the command line, the JVM will go down into the hardware, probe around, see what you got, and then it would ask a bunch of questions and, and go through some heuristics and say, ah, you need the parallel collector. And it pretty much always answered, you know, uh, it always came up with the same answer no matter what. So, you know, it was a really fancy way of getting to uh, a foregone conclusion. Um, the foregone conclusion today is G1 is going to be your default collector if you're going to Java 9. And G1 works quite differently uh, than the generational collectors that we're used to using or that we have been using in the past. And so um, I think it's it's behooves people to actually take a look at how the uh, G1 works just in case you get into these situations uh, where you need to cope with it. Um, and, that, and that gets into the first point. It's like, you know, here is the party line. How do you tune G1 GC? Right, you set the max heap size, and if you don't bother to set that, then it's going to look at how much RAM you have, and then it's going to decide to take a quarter of that and say, Okay, that's the heap size, max heap size, and then it's going to ask for a pause time goal. And if you don't set that, then it's going to take 200 milliseconds. So, ideally, you don't have to set anything, you just don't even set max heap size, you don't have to set the pause time goal and everything works and it's wonderful right and so at that point we can just finish the presentation and say that's everything you need to know about g1 any questions uh i don't currently have any questions uh local jugs that we have on the hangouts do you have any questions well 
Okay, if you don't have any questions, let me um, show you the problem with the party line. If, if, if I can just, if you allow me, since you interrupted, uh, if you allow me uh, a small comment. So we ask in the Slack channel and there are people running G1 GC on Java 8 on production servers with heaps 60 to 120 gigabytes large. And then uh, the small poll shows that mostly people, like six out of 10 people don't run G1 in production, but some of them do run. Yeah, and, that, and that's what we're finding now, is that we're finding that a lot of people are starting to move to G1. Not a lot of people are there, but what happens is that as soon as they start getting into the 64 gigabyte heap, um, then they're looking at this and going like, okay, well, even at 32 gigabytes, <clears throat> we're seeing that people are saying like, okay, let's see if we can get a better performance out of the G1 than we currently do with CMS uh, by, uh, you know, even, even in Java 8. Now, and, and, and the trick is that if you're going to go to the G1, you're going, you need to be in a position where you can just can, can quickly and almost continuously update the JDK so, or the JVM. So as soon as a new version comes out, you want to get the next one because of the number of continual fixes that keep coming in, in each, uh, each release that are just specifically due to bugs inside uh, the G1. But if you're using Java 7, it's highly, actually we would say um, anything before 1.8.0 underscore 20, you probably want to leave the G1 alone uh, because while well, in 7 you can get corrupted heaps because of the garbage collector, uh, not getting some of the barriers correct. And in Java 8, there were some other issues up in up until about uh, 20. And then after that, um, I think uh, you, basically people stuck a fork in it and said, okay, done. And then pulled the fork out and said, well, okay, mostly done. So so, th so there's a lot of uh, bugs that are actually being being fixed, right? And the other issue we find is that, you know, when people finally do get to using this, if they're not getting the results that they like, um, it's really, really a complex collector. There's a lot of moving parts in there. And, um, you know, getting all of the moving parts to work in, in, in um, uh, and cooperate with each other is, tends to be very, very, very difficult. Um, because, you know, if you try to go in one direction, you're going to find that you're going to stub your toe. And if you turn around to go in the other direction, you're going to bang your nose into something. So, you know, so you'll reason through things and you'll think, this is it. And then, bang, something happens that you didn't recognize. And then all of a sudden, uh, you're in trouble. Um, so that's my marketing slide. So the zero turnaround guys took up six minutes of my talk time with their marketing slides. I plan to take 30 more seconds. Um, and you can see, whoops. Um, I forgot to take the phone off my desk. Sorry about that. So I'll take 40 seconds. Um, so we've <clears throat> basically co-founded, uh, a bunch of us co-founded uh, JClarity. Um, and what we're doing in JClarity was we're trying to build the next generation of, what, of performance diagnostic tooling um, that is scalable, predictable, and will also function in uh, production environments. And maybe you also know me for co-founding JCrete. Uh, mostly people think Heinz founded JCrete, um, but he actually has a couple of co-founders of which I'm uh, one of them. And uh, anyway, some other things there that you can look about if you're interested. So getting back to the real stuff, uh, now that we blew through the marketing things, you know, there's things that we need to know. We need to know that this is a regional collector, uh, which means it's going to partition the heap differently than how it used to partition, uh, how you're used to seeing it partition. The algorithms are going to be somewhat familiar. They're going to work. They're variants on familiar themes. So mark sweep is the uh, collector that you're used to seeing in, in well, for most environments, with the exception of uh, Python or something like that. Um, if you're using managed runtimes, then mark sweep is the, the, the generally the weapon of choice. Um, in this case, we're going to have young generational collections. We're still going to have these thing happening in tenured, which we'll talk about later, and we'll do something also strange known as a mixed collection. And we need to understand the number of data structures that are involved down here. So there's like collection sets, remembered sets, 
refinement cues and things like that. And once we put all these things together and understand it, then we can then sort of work through a cost model. And if we have the right cost model and we put the right inputs into it, hopefully we'll be able to come up with reasonable ways of tuning uh, G1, GC. So this so far this year, I've tuned approximately 3,000 JVMs in a number of different clusters. Um, and I actually, the number just climbed because we're just at the tail end of tuning uh, Wikipedia, Wikimedia's uh, JVMs. So, um, so that, that's interesting. I'll show you a log, uh, hopefully, if we have enough time at the end. OK. Um, so what does the G1 GC heap look like? Well, OK, I'm going to draw one here and, over time. And this is one that we've actually drawn from data that we've derived from real production environments. Um, so unlike all of the other versions of G1GC heaps that you see, um, those are lies. This is the truth. <laughs> OK. So we're going to reserve the memory, just as we did before. And then we're going to divide the heap up into a number of different regions using the calculation you can see here. I'm going to not, I'm going to, I'll let you look at it as homework. But the idea is here, we're going to create these regions that are going to be 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, or 32 megabytes in size. And then I'm going to take those regions, and I'm going to put them in a free list. And so when my application starts running, um, what I'm actually going to do is um, I'm going to start grabbing regions from the free list. And then I allocate objects into that particular region. And when I fill the region, then I'll keep doing that again. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, at the beginning, I'm going to say, OK, you have these, this many regions allocated for Eden. right? So we'll just run through the whole allocation process here. So we're going to label that region as Eden, allocate. And then we're just going to keep um, going to the free list, getting the next region, allocate, allocate, allocate full, and get next region, continue forward. When we consumed all of our regions uh, that ergonomics tells us that we're allowed to have, then we're going to call for a young uh, generational uh, collector collection. So, so we're going to an allocation failure. And of course, that, gener that sets up the mechanism to, to perform a, uh, a GC cycle. So what we're going to do in the GC cycle is we're going to take all of the regions that we want to collect, and we're going to have them form a C set. And then we're going to go through this stop the world thing that everyone loves. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do a young collection, which is going to be a, a, a mark sweep. Well, I'm lying to you. It's not really a mark sweep. It's a variant of that. But you know we can just consider it like. Mark all the live, you know, find all of the GC roots. So calculate a root set, uh, right, for everything in the C set. And then I'm going to trace all the ref references, mark all the live data um, that I can reach that's in the C set. And then I'm going to evacuate all of the live data to the thing known as a two space, which is actually also known as a survivor space. And there's other names for it, but you're going you're gonna to see it as survivor or two space. And then, after all of the live data has been evacuated out of the regions, I can take all of those regions and place them back on the free list. I'll have ergonomics recalculate the number of regions to allocate to Eden. And we'll use a number of heuristics, including um, allocation rates and things like that, to just say, OK, should we make this bigger? Should we make it smaller? Um, the idea here is if we make it bigger, we have long pause times. And if we make it smaller, we have shorter pause times. Um, and we'll question that theory at the end. OK. So at, at the end of the whole thing, you end up with something that looks like this. And you can see um, the ergonomics has some ranges to work in. So I have some um, values there. It's going to try to shrink down to 5%. That's going to minimize the pause time. But of course, depending on your allocation rate, that could dramatically increase the frequency of collections of young gen. So one of the things you can do if you need to control frequency is play with these two values here. Well, particularly the G1 new size percent equals 5, right? 
Um, and we do that sometimes. Sometimes we'll make that bigger to slow the frequency down if we can't make the heat bigger for some reason or we don't want to for some reason. Okay. Um, so what does this look in real life? Well, here's a map that we took from a live allocation. So you can see there's all of the young generational regions, I, aka the two space Eden regions are going to be down here. Um, and what we're going to see is that eventually we're going to promote the data from the survive regions into this thing called a tenured region. And when we do that, the tenure regions are going to be allocated from the top left-hand side. So that's the blue, blue squares. There are a number of tenured regions. So the data is just going to travel from young to survivor to survivor to survivor to survivor till it hits the tenuring threshold and then bang up into uh, the tenured region. And, um, you know, that's, that's a familiar story that we saw with the uh, generational collectors. They sort of behaved in the same way. Okay, so this is what we said, you know, mark sweep, you know, mix of parallel, there's a mix of parallel serial phases in there. So a lot of the work is, seri is, uh, is parallelized. Some of the work is, can only be done uh, serially. Um, and even some of the parallelized work can't be actually broken up. Um, so you're gonna see things like, um, for instance, a code cache is where all the compiled code gets to. That uh, mark, in that space cannot be parallelized. So that's done with a single thread. So one of the things they've done to fix that is to actually um, segment uh, the code cache. So you can have uh, different partitions of the code cache so that you can actually parallelize the uh, marking uh, in the code cache. Um, so there's a calculate, so there's pretty much a, a couple of things that are, uh, that could be problematic here. Um, and the one is like calculation of a root set for the C set. So if you think about it, okay, so what's a root object? Well, a root object is this thing that's known and it's at the head of the, you know, all of the reference chains that basically keeps all your data in, in, in heap, when it, all your live data in heap, right? So that's the thing we traverse. Um, and in this case, um, to figure out where the roots are, we're gonna to have to go into the stack traces, we're gonna to have to go into the code cache, which I told you, and we're also gonna to have to go into every other single uh, region in memory, right? So if you have this one poor region in memory and we wanna calculate its root set, we're gonna to have to find out who's pointing into that region, which means I need to go everywhere, everywhere in heap. And I need to do that for every single uh, region that's in the C set. So that looks like an M times N complexity problem, and that, that's a real problem. So we need to cope with that, right? So, so you can see that right here, right? So the roots are basically here. Um, all of the young generational regions are gonna go into the C set. Um, so we potentially have this uh, really big problem um, where basically scan for roots, I say scan for roots is linear to the size of heap, it's actually worse than that. Now, this gets into another problem, okay? So we have, out, we have things allocating, and we have the collectors collecting, and you can have the collectors actually do all the work, but if you have them do all the work, then you're gonna get longer pause times. You can have the allocators do a lot of work, like you do in C, where the allocators actually do all the work, um, but then that's going to have slower application throughput. So what we want to try to do is balance the work the allocators do um, again, versus the work the collectors do to try to come up with you know, some, some happy medium where we don't slow the application down, but we don't give the collector too much work, right? Now, um, in the G1, we want to also deal with this time complexity issue. And the way we're going to deal with it is introduce these things called remembered sets. And so every time I have foo in one region, in a tenured region, right, I'm gonna mutate it, a pointer in there so that foo points to bar, and the bar is in a young generational region, then 
that pointer is potentially part of the um, uh, the um, of the of the root set, and so what I need to do is track that. So how I'm going to track that is I'm going to say, okay, so if we made that connection between foo and bar, let's record that pointer value into um, an R set. And so each region is going to have its own R set. And what's going to happen is that as I, you know, as I as I point from you know from foo into bar, I'm going to record that particular pointer into the R set. Um, and that comes with its own set of complexities. And so we don't really want our application threads to do that. So what we're going to have is these uh, R set refinement threads that are actually going to be there, and and they're actually going to update the queues for us. But that means we have to pass that pointer value off from the mutator thread to the uh, R set refinement threads, and um, we're going to do that through an R set refinement queue. And so what happens is that we're going to start putting these pointer values into the R set refinement queue, or a data structure that contains these things, I should say, more correctly. And if the if the queue isn't very full, nothing's going to happen. That's mostly because we don't really want these R set refinement queue threads to be running. And the reason we don't want them to be running is because, of course, they take uh, CPU away from your application. However, when the queue gets to a certain fullness, then we're going to start ra ramping up the, uh, the refinement threads. And they're going to start pulling references and updating R sets. Now, what we're going to try to do is calculate this so that uh, R set refinement. Um, well, OK, let me reset. Um, so before a garbage collection can run, this queue has to be empty, which means that if we call for a garbage collection um, and there are values in this queue or R sets that need to be updated, then the garbage collection threads are going to be responsible for emptying the queue. So whatever the pause time goal is, we want to make sure that less than 10% of that pause time goal is burnt uh, updating the remembered sets. OK? So as the queue gets full, we're going to start getting more aggressive emptying it. And by the time you see you get into the red here, the application threads are, you know, everybody's in. We're going to capture the, we're going to slow the application. Uh, down by making sure that it does its own R set um, updates itself. Okay, so that's pretty much how that works. Let's switch into another topic. Let's talk about tenured. Now, tenured works sort of like the same but different. Um, in tenured, what we're going to have is what's known as a concurrent mark phase. So when tenured regions start taking up about 45% of, of heap, it's going to trigger a mark of tenured. There's going to be no um, real collection of tenured in the traditional sense. So it's not going to be a mark and sweep. It's just going to be a mark. And that's going to be a mostly concurrent event. So the next young generational collection that runs We'll piggyback an initial mark on it. And you can see that's a stop the world event. So the uh, records here, the red ones are stop the world events, the green ones are concurrent, and the one that triggers the cycle is going to be the young generational collection with the initial mark um, uh, packed on it. Uh, the role of the initial mark is to calculate um, the, um, uh, the root set. And as it calculates the root set, it's also going to step forward um, so that uh, the starting root set is going to be something that's self-contained um, in these regions. OK? Um, and then we're going to start the application again, and everybody's going to go running again, and it's going to be mutating. So eventually, we want to reconcile the change that has happened in the world from our initial snapshot to what's happened now. Um, there's yeah, I won't talk about snapshot at the beginning, but you can look that up if you're interested in in, in more depth and in, into how all of that works. And you can see that there's going to be a remark here, and the remark is 
going to sweep things that are dirty to try to reconcile the difference between everything that happened between the initial mark and, and, and the remark. And you can see I'm also going to do reference processing in here, and that's, that's important, as you'll see coming up. And then there's some cleanup things. So, um, so when we build a C set, in this case, right, um, we're not just going to put in the young generational uh, regions for the uh, for the young generational collector to sweep them. We're also going to we're going to take a subset of tenured regions, and we're going to call this a mixed collection. And there's a number of rules which guide how the mixed collection works. So we'll just go through that in a second. Okay. So. Um, so here's our re here's all our regions, right? So we're going to do a mark, and as part of, part of doing the mark, I'm going to calculate uh, liveliness. Okay, so you can see there's our black squares and the green are that's our live data, and what we can do is now sort these things by liveliness. Boom, that's fun, right? So we look to the left. We have two black boxes. They're empty. Brilliant. We can put those back on the free list immediately. Right? So those are free. Everything to the right of that line is going to be more than 85% full. And those are going to be expensive to collect because that's a lot of object copy time, right? We need to evacuate the region, and we evacuate the region by copying all the data. So let's just exclude them from the C set. So we have this group of regions in the middle that are eligible for collection. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to chunk them. And I'm going to have up to eight mixed collections basically clearing these things out. OK? Um, now, um, I'm going to use the time budget now and some estimates of how long it's going to take to evacuate each of these regions to decide how many regions actually get into each uh, collection set. And when I've used up, you know, uh, so I got to fit them all into, you know, maximally eight. And there's a couple of other uh, parameters here that, that will actually control what's going on. So G1 heap waste percent, which means if I'm not going to collect more than 10% of heap, then just, you know, give up. Don't do it anymore. So, that's how the mixed collection works. So there's only one last topic to really talk about, and that's this thing called humongous allocations. So the humongous allocation is, OK, well, let's look at it this way. You have a 1 meg region, and I'm going to do a 2 meg allocation. Obviously, it doesn't fit. We've got a problem, buffer overrun, all of those wonderful things. Um, so how are we going to cope with that? Well. I'm going to do this thing known as a humongous allocation. So um, humongous allocation means any allocation that is at least half the size of a region. So you can see in this particular diagram, I have these coral and red regions. So the coral is a humongous region start, and the red is continuations. So if you look at the one at the very top, um, you can see that that's probably been in heat for a long time. It's not moved. So my guess is that that's a cache of some sort. The ones at the bottom, in this particular case, are JSON strings from serialization from servers in a cluster communicating with each other. And so you can see, um, you know, there, there can be some issues here, right? I mean, you know, tenured's got holes in it and everything. And in order to allocate, in, you know, these big things into tenured, we have to have enough contiguous space to hold them. And if we don't have enough space to hold them, then we have a fragmentation issue. At the worst case is we defrag. In order to defrag, we have to do a full GC. Currently, that is single threaded. They are currently working on parallelizing this. It doesn't matter. Even if they parallelize this, a full GC is going to be a significant pause event, right? Um, so what do we do? Well, let's put some reserve space in there. And what you'll see is that the tenured space will dip into reserve space and beyond. It'll actually 
start causing young to shrink if it needs to in order to have, uh, prevent the full GC from happening, okay? But if it has to do the full GC, it's going to do the full GC, and there's just no way around it. Cool. So if we want to see what these collectors are up to, um, then we need to get a GC log. So prior to 9, these were the settings. I don't have the settings for 9 in. I should put them in, but um, we just haven't done that yet. Um, and you can look at a GC log, but a GC log is like any other log. It's neither human nor machine readable. So if you don't like reading GC logs, then uh, we've got some tooling to help you uh, with that particular issue. And, you know, let's look at a GC log uh, using um, the tooling that we use, which is uh, Sensum. So um, there's a VJUG. So I don't know if you guys can see all this. I'm going to make it smaller. And then I'm going to do something. Is that, that's not actually helping. OK. I'm just going to make it bigger then. Hopefully that will help. Um, Let's go to the top here. So we have a number of analytics here that we use to look at the GC log. And you can see that it's complaining about a high pause time. So there was a 1.7 second pause time in here. And actually, the total pause time is 5.75% of the runtime, uh, which means our GC overhead is basically 5.75%. And uh, let me guess. So that's an issue. We would like that to be that number to be less than five percent, right? So we're getting a warning here saying our application throughput is 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 a problem in this particular case. Um, we have everything else looking clean. We actually do some analytics on kernel times, uh, which can be helpful uh, to sort out what's causing it to pause. Um, I'll go down here and look at this, and we can we can actually get some ideas. So this so this is like a three hour, three and a half hour log. It's basically allocated almost nine terabytes. Um, so we have an allocation rate of three hundred and seventy three megabytes per second, which is pretty good. Nothing to complain about there. Uh, total pause times breakdown of the collector that's running. So you can see we have four hundred seventy two mixed collections running. So we. Uh, out of 3,068 young generational collections running. Uh, so, so, so you can get um, um, an idea of, of, um, of what's going on. Oh, yeah, so here's our mixed collection saying, there's, like I said, there's 472. Over here, we can see there's a distribution, right? So this, this, this meant that there was like three mixed collections in a row, three times, all the way up to we had six uh, mixed collections in a cycle 64 times. I like this to go to eight, and I'd like this to be pretty much all of the mixed collections here because um, what that means uh, in when when we have that happen, that means that we're getting a nice um, even distribution of the pause time load uh, over all of the mixed collections. I can go down and look at the heap summary. So this is. Um, basically occupancy of the heap after the collection. And you can see as we get over to like 2350, close to midnight, we have this big event here. Um, oops. And let's just make this a little bit smaller so I can see what's going on here. Uh, we don't actually have any full GCs in here as good so that it recovered from it. But you can see in a 32 gig heap, we had this, you know, so we'd be interested in, okay, what's going on there that we get this run up. Um, and there's another run up a little later on, um, a little about um, one, you know, 20 after one, I guess, or sorry, 20 after 12. So I can use this information to figure out what's going on. More interestingly, if we look at the pause times, 
we can see that um, our other pause times are, most of them are not great per se, but they're not bad. Uh, you know, they're bundled under 300 milliseconds for the most part. But I have all of these red triangle things, and they're just all over the place, right? Uh, and so they're, 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 that's our long pause, right? And those are remarks. Uh, so if we want to go figure out what's going on here, then we sort of have to get an idea about, okay, you know, what's taking the remarks so long. But let's look at the young generational things first, and we can see, see if we can see anything interesting here. So here's all of our phases. Remember I said young gen was a number of different phases. I didn't really go through them. There's some parallel phases, and then we have another, uh, all these other phases are serial. And if I look at it, I can see in here that um, the... Um, parallel phase is really well mixed up with the other phase. Normally the parallel phase should dominate. And, and, and that sort of um, magenta color, not the blue ones, should be down at the bottom. And the blue ones should be like at the top, in, in a band at the top. So this is a really, really messy log. So we can look at the, at the other phases and try to figure out what's going on. And if we look at it, you see like, okay, well, let's look at it as a percent. You can see the dominant cost in this collection is going to be these greenish triangle things, which happens to be reference processing. Okay. So in this particular case, um, we have a problem in processing references. Um, there, it's just taking a long time. Now, um, it's quite possible, um, well, you know, we can come down here, we can turn on a reference processing tracking so we can see what's going on. And we look at it and say, oh yeah, look at that. The remark reference processing time is through the roof. And if we look at the reference counts, we can see, oh yeah, look at that. Um, the, 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 the remark, or there's a lot of weak references being processed here, as well as a, a, as a significant number of, of final references. So you can go into the application and try to figure out what's doing this and reduce it. The other thing you can do is you can tell a JVM, okay, uh, let's, par let's par uh, process all of these references in parallel. So we'll turn that flag on and see what's going on. So this is a log I actually got today, and that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna turn on parallel reference processing. And my guess is in this particular case, uh, our, our our pause times for remarks should go down to about 250 milliseconds. And once we've done that, we'll rebalance out uh, the phase percentages here, and then what we'll see is the, the, a normal banding pattern in, in, uh, in, uh, in this particular chart that tells us that object copy time is probably gonna be the dominant phase. So if we look at the parallel phases again, you can see that the red things are the object copy times, and they tend to dominate. In this case, we also have um, some blue triangles in there, which is update remembered set. So that comes back into the refinement queue, um, not being completely cleaned uh, before uh, the uh, uh, you know before the collection is called for. Um, one other thing we might actually look in here, um, look for in here is humongous allocations to see if that is an issue, and by this chart, you really can't see if there's any humongous allocations, but um, I know that there's been some issue with them, not really a big one, but you can see down here that we've actually had one initial mark triggered by a humongous allocation. So, um, so not, not really an issue. I mean, it's going to happen. Um, you don't have to worry about it unless it becomes more frequent uh, in this case. Um, no G1 failure events in here, so we're, we're quite okay in terms of sizing and everything like that. Um, so this heap is getting to become, is starting to get into, we're starting to work it into shape. Um, we'll, we'll do some investigation to figure out what's happened here. Obviously, we'll turn on the parallel reference processing, um, which should hopefully reduce the reference processing times and things like that. But, um, you know, the bigger takeaway is that with some really nice visualizations, good visualizations of your data, you can really see what's really going on um, inside 
the collector, and that's going to help you know give you the clues that you need in order to understand uh, what it is that you actually need to touch in order to tune this thing. Right. Um, now I mentioned that object copy time typically dominates. Um, the you know which is both good news, bad news. Um, the good news is that well. There is no good news. Okay, let's just go to the bad news. There's nothing you can do about it easily. All you can do is reduce the frequency of the collection. You have two throttles for that. One is going to be go into your application and make it more uh, memory efficient. And you can see that um, you know there there could be some memory efficiency work that could be done here. So ignoring the outliers because those tend to be anomalies of the calculation because these are estimates. You can see that there's times when the allocation right here goes up to you know between two, three, four gigabytes per second. And those would be fairly high allocation rates. And yeah, it's server independent uh, for a bunch of reasons which I don't have time to go into because I'm just about over time now. So um, really, um, in, in this case, we're going to see there's, there's um, uh, that's one thing we can do. The other thing we can do is uh, we can actually um, it, is, is to try to play with the regions, uh, not the region sizes, but the uh, internal um, allocations, uh, how the uh, how the collector is going to shrink uh, to try to not let it shrink so much and, and try to do things in order to slow down the rate of young generational collections. And when you slow down the rate of young generational collections, of course, um, you will uh, eliminate some of the overhead, OK? And I'm going to have to skip this slide, unfortunately, because of the timing issue. But you can see um, there's, this is a weak generational hypothesis season. What it's saying is that, um, that uh, making a, young, a larger heap, in this case, shouldn't really affect uh, the overall pause time, right? Where the effect, what's going to affect the pause time is going to be in the variability in, um, in, in the shape of this curve and how it varies over time. Right, so I'm going to end it there. Give us a brief introduction. Um, if you're interested in Sensum, um, please do uh, visit uh, jclarity.com and, um, and grab a, you can get, grab an evaluation, copy the tool to see how it's going on. Um, I run workshops where we go into this um, extensively, deeply. I run the next one, public is Munich, and I'll run one in Paris after that. Um, so Apple, I'll, I'll be doing the one in Munich with Appleton Consulting and the one in Paris with Exibia. Um, we have friends at JClarity. If you're looking to find out, you know, to talk with other people in the performance tuning community, that's a good place to go. Cool. That's all I'm going to say, unless people have questions. That's wonderful. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I went three minutes over. No, no, it's absolutely fine. Uh, we have we have almost twelve minutes for the questions, and if if needed, we can run all the time until the next session starts. Uh, do we have any questions from the jugs present, uh, Ivor? Michael. They're stunned. They're stunned. While you're thinking about the questions, we have a couple in the RC, uh, not the RC, in the Slack. So, uh, and it started, there were some answers as well, but maybe you can just uh, confirm or quickly answer. So how does G1 work with less than uh, two gigabytes of memory? Like say, if you would like to run that inside a Docker container or something, yeah, with less than, with that small amount of memory, I'd prefer a parallel collector. Oh. Um, that's the short answer. Uh, you know, the longer answer, you're just not going to get enough regions for the collector to work with, so it's not going to be able to partition memory effectively. Yeah, that makes sense. It, it also with a parallel collector, the uh, main problem that the regions are way too large. Uh, right, wouldn't, wouldn't wouldn't actually appear. Uh, yeah, and I, you're going to get. Uh, Less overhead and shorter pause times with the parallel collector, I think. With that small heap. Another question from Carl. Uh, do you know if the latest Java 8 releases 
do they have the most recent G1 GC updates or do people really need to upgrade to Java 9 to get them? Um, my understanding is that most of the stuff that's done in 9 and fixed in 9 actually is backported. Uh, I don't know how long that's going to last, though. Um, I fear that you will have to go to 9 in order to keep using the latest and greatest. Excellent. Uh, coming back to the question about the small amounts of memory, so Rob follow-ups uh, in the Slack chat. At what point would you suggest pushing over from parallel to G1 GC, or does it completely depend on the workload? Um, no, the workload, no. I, it's... I don't really have a good answer for that question. I mean, that's a really, really good question. Um, I, I, I kind of get the feeling that you need at least 12 gigs before the G1 becomes effective. But that's sort of, you know, but that's sort of beyond the range where the parallel collector works well. So there's this no man's land between, you know, where nothing, where CMS really worked really well, uh, but unfortunately, it's been deprecated. You can still use it. But eventually, it won't be available to you in, in 10, I think. What, no, what do they call it? 10, 18 point something? Six? 18.3. Three, whatever, the, whatever they call it. In March. Yeah. I'm going to uh -huh. call it 10. I don't care what they call it. OK. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but if you get into like four, five, six gigs, then I'd probably start trying to use uh, either CMS or G1. Uh, certainly G1 because it's the future, so you want to know how what you need to do to your app to make your app work well with it. Um, and, and don't worry, uh, the parallel collector is an exact collector. G1 isn't, neither is CMS, so you always need more heap when you move from parallel or serial to a G1 collector. Is it because you will waste space on the regions? Or? Yeah, you don't get an exact collection. You know, with a parallel collection, you stop the world, you clean everything up till there's like not a speck of dust left, and then you start everything up. Since you're running concurrently and you have all these other wonky thresholds and things like that, uh, you'll clean young gen perfectly, but tenured will remain somewhat dirty. Excellent. Uh, I have one more question from Slack, uh, which I'm not sure I parsed correctly myself. It's a question from Mohan, so bear with me. So do you know why G1GC uses the parameter values for mean heap free ratio equals 40 and max heap free ratio equals 70, right? So somewhere in the middle. And the parallel GC in Java 8 uses the mean heap free ratio 0 and max free ratio 100, so the full range. Is it the same because of the wasted space, or can you comment on that? Well, um, basically, uh, these values are used to try to resize heap um, after a garbage collection so that you, so the amount of free heap is within these particular ratios. Um, as with everything in the JDK, a lot of these values are chosen because of how well the benchmarking performs. And so there probably was some benchmarking advantages to use the 0 and the 100, and some benchmarking advantages to use the 40 and the 70. And so, so they would settle in on those numbers just because they would get the best results with benchmarking. Um, so uh, there's no really good reason why there are those values, except for you know, those particular benchmarks. It, it, it's the same with parallel processing, uh, reference processing. Mm -hmm. Their benchmark generates about 25,000 references per second. If we go back and look at the GC log we're looking at, I mean, it was well over 150,000 references per second. Okay, and I find that that, that you know that 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 value of 150,000 is more normal for a production environment than the 25,000. Um, so sometimes we'll just play with these because they simply don't work for your application for whatever reason because you know your application is different than the benchmark. Yeah, okay. That sounds so reasonable. right. So sorry, sorry, going back. The the reason why they don't use parallel uh, for reference processing is because they get better results in the benchmark with serial, obviously, because parallel comes with overhead. Yeah, that that's reasonable. When the benchmarks will change uh, or the information will change, they will probably consider migrating. Well, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, I think the last question comes from money and. Uh, 
what tools does jClarity have to improve to improve application and infrastructure performance? So you showed us the uh, log analyzer. Um, yeah, like I said, we're we're working on building the next generation diagnostic engine. So our diagnostic engine Illuminate is based off of um, it's it's able to do a deep dive into an environment and figure out what's going on. Um, and it's using uh, a lot of heuristics and uh, some models and other things that we have. So it's not a dumb engine like typical profilers. It's an intelligent engine that uh, knows how to make decisions and to adjust to uh, conditions on the ground. Um, and we also have some live GC monitoring stuff that's uh, tacked on as part of that, uh, but we actually sell that separately. Um, so if people are just interested in watching what's happening with their garbage collection and they're interested in getting the same quality of data that you would get out of our desktop product, then we have a streaming Sensum uh, product that will actually um, give, us, give you that quality of data so that you can actually see what's going on. And we, we plan on expanding that offering in the near future uh, where um, you can look at, you know, dozens of servers at a, at a time and, and see, have a really, um, be able to do a deep dive and figure out really what's going on in these servers in, in live environments. And we'll have, we have heuristics attached to that. So we can look at conditions that um, I would say that most operations people wouldn't even recognize and we can automatically detect them and tell you that, hey, this is going on in your environment. For instance, we find a lot of people blaming the garbage collector for long pauses. Uh, when the long pause is actually a result of something happening in the environment. And since we can differentiate between the two, we can actually say, yeah, you just saw a long GC pause, but guess what? Not the garbage collector's fault. Go clean up this problem over here. And by the way, if you clean up this problem over here, your application is just going to run better because what disturbs the garbage collector also disturbs everything else. Yeah. And, and, uh, just because you can't see it in the everything else and you can only see it in the garbage collector, uh, you know, it doesn't mean it's not there. <laughs> and, you know. Excellent. All those things sound really exciting. So I guess the best the best place to learn about those uh, and the upcoming releases would be the jclarity.com uh, yeah. website. Yeah, go to jclarity.com, contact us for a trial um, or download trials and, you know, just uh, kick the tire. Um, we've been, you know, working on this for a while. It's all been very experimental. So we're very excited to actually be releasing products that are uh, is smarter than tool the toolings that you've seen in the past. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Kirk. Everyone, you. this was Kirk Pepperdine with a session on G1GC. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed that. It was very insightful. So uh, thank you, Kirk. Thank you, the jugs who joined us, the Malmo jug and the uh, I will mess the name again. Uh, you reach Jug. Uh, it was lovely to have you. Uh, thank you, everyone watching on us on YouTube. And we're going to continue the VJUG24 with the upcoming session. And that would be just in a couple of minutes. And that would be the Diabolical Developer Guide to JVM Performance Tuning by Martin.